Here's my Tom Duke lecture entitled Physics of Chemosensing by Bacteria, How Bacteria Sense and Respond to Chemicals. And this prize lecture award is given out by the Institute of Physics in the UK to promote biophysics and to celebrate Tom Duke's contributions to the field. So Tom Duke worked on a lot of different topics ranging from motor proteins, polymer physics and how the inner ear works but also how bacteria sense and symptoms chemicals in the environment, a process called chemotaxis. And this is also how I got into the field of biological physics. So here in this uh, lecture, I wanted to talk about how, what physics contributed to sensing and signaling in cells in chemotaxis. And that includes uh, stuff from Tom Duke, but also my own contributions and the contributions from my collaborators. So chemotaxis is illustrated here from these trajectories, how cells swim up chemical gradients, that's from simulations, and you know how this really works, you will find out here. So normally in the beginning of a talk, like I said, you show how complicated biology is to justify that model simplifications have to be done. Here in bacteria chemotaxis, the pathway is very simple, starting from ligands binding receptors, um, the signal is then transduced to the motors, which regulates the swimming. Nevertheless, there's a lot of complexity surrounding this very simple pathway. So the receptors are complicated transmembrane proteins, which goes to the inner membrane and have these sites, which are modified. The regulatory domains of these proteins by themselves are complicated. Then often one treats chemotaxis the sensing in isolation to metabolism, the uptake of the nutrients. However, the metabolic pathway in E. coli, a typical bacterium, is very complicated. This is illustrated here. Then in reality, um, chemotaxis is not completely isolated from gene regulation because if chemotaxis proteins are expressed, other things can't be expressed because of the finite resources in a cell. So the regulation of the proteins is, of course, tightly done in the cell. And then receptors from clusters, these honeycomb receptor clusters, um, that's relatively complicated but a beautiful example of assembly as well. And then you have the motor, which is a marvel of evolutionary design principles. So ultimately we want to understand how the behavior of bacteria emerges from these molecular components, how they swim up a chemical gradient. So to cut to the chase, bacteria like E. coli, what they do is they do a random walk and they bias it in a chemical gradient. So they have these alternate runs where they swim more or less straight and then there's a random reorientation which is called a tumble so the run comes from the flagella bundling up and the tumble comes when the flagella don't bundle and they um, they fly apart and the cell tumbles so there can be an effective diffusion constant associated with this just from dimensionality analysis it's velocity squared times uh, um, run time and what is now regulated in chemotax is, is the duration of the runs this tau here so what happens now in a chemical gradient, so the runs are elongated up the gradient in a favorable direction and they are shorter down the chemical gradient if it happens that the cell goes in the wrong direction. So the question is, you know, what are these physical constraints which um, shapes this behavior? So now if you talk about chemotaxis, um, it's really, we to really talk about sensory systems. And what are sensory systems for? They encode natural stimuli and natural scenes in some sense. So to illustrate this point, I will talk about uh, the visual system and what are the challenges now. So the light intensities can change over orders of magnitude from uh, bright daylight to moonless night. Even in the scene of a log on the beach, we have these very large differences of brightness. And um, nevertheless, um, there's a lot of structure in this random picture. And, um, you know, if you would randomize these pixels, it would look like that. It would look very different from the picture of the natural scene on the left side. So how can this be encoded now, the structure and the challenge of the light intensities? So now if we look at different areas, the bright areas, the dark areas, what is then um, clear is that the reflectances of these objects are relatively similar, but the illumination by light is different. So it scales up and down, not only the the variation of light intensities in these little areas, delta i, but also the background. So everything scales up and down together. So there's a scale invariance and a good way to deal with it is to sense contrast or to encode contrast. And this is one of many design principles which play a role in sensory systems. So now bacteria, they also live in complicated environments. They certainly don't live in a petri dish. They normally live in multicellular organizations like structures like biofilms or colonies and um, 
a typical place where they live is in our intestines. So they sit in the mucus layer and they help us digest food and keep our immune system sharp. So that's really important to understand because we really have um, uh, many more bacteria cells than human cells. We have basically two kilograms of bacteria in our body at any moment in time. And so to understand this is fundamentally important. Particularly, we would like to learn more about these chemical environments, which are often inaccessible. Just to illustrate bacteria more, in particular, if people work on larger nucleated mammalian cells, they look very different from bacteria. So bacteria are tiny, like a femtoliter, but they have a remarkable structure as well inside the cell. So we have receptor clusters and flagella. And what is now remarkable about these cells is because of their small size, there's a lot of variability in noise. So it's mainly because there are small numbers of molecules in the cell. And of course, they're reacting also randomly. So variability can be so large that individuals and in isogenetic populations do very different things from one another. These are identical twins, but they express different proteins. And this is called epigenetic variability. Then it can be so strong, the variability, that if you have some sort of chemical, like a nutrient on the, on the horizontal axis, the cell pen can be in two different states, depending if we come from here or from here. So here is these are uninduced cells, they don't express certain proteins, these are induced, they express these proteins, which they use to utilize this. This bistability and the hysteresis loop are very well known from physics. And we find this in bacteria. These are very simple ways for bacteria to specialize and, um, and form different subpopulations. So here in this talk, I wanted to briefly talk about historic aspects of bacteria chemotaxis, in particular the physical limits, how accurately a small cell can sense its environment, and then also about signal propagation in absence of knowing much about the biochemistry, like decades ago. Then in the second part, I will talk about gain and precise adaptation. So gain meaning signal amplification by receptor clusters, and then also a more recent information theoretic approach. Howard Burke and Edward Purcell thought about um, how accurately cells can sense the environment with these receptors in the membrane. And this picture just illustrates, again, the small number of components which lead to the stochasticity. And individual molecules arriving by diffusion and binding and unbinding and so on. They ask in a given amount of time delta t how accurately can the cell determine its chemoattractant concentration. What they then realized is at these small um, length scales, these low Reynolds numbers environments, is that diffusion is very important and that there is no inertia effectively. So a cell which would stop propel itself forward it would stop within one angstrom. They also realized that the temperature is very important. So KBT is large, so it affects the cell movement even. So it's sort of a very simple model. Um, how, how do how do quantify this accuracy of sensing? It's sort of a spherical cell, which is permeable to, to molecules. And then without worrying too much about the mechanism, how it's done, it's sort of about a cell could count the numbers of molecules inside and determine the concentration, because concentration is the number divided by the volume. It's not, um, it's actually quite a clever model because even in this case, we have things arriving by diffusion and they can unbind, get out and come back even. So these properties, um, which are also important for receptor binding, are also included in this model. So how are the number of molecules distributed without any um, further knowledge? Um, the easiest assumption is that they are Poisson distributed. So variance is equal to the mean, and they have these two different notations. So now we're interested in the relative uncertainty, so standard deviation over the mean. That's also the coefficient of variation, and it's a unitless quantity. C0 is a true background concentration. So we can turn this in um, the number of molecules just by getting rid of the volume. And because it's Poisson distributed, we have one over square with the mean number of molecules, which is just volume times the concentration. So now in reality, as I said, the cell can do um, multiple measurements because it has time delta t available. How many measurements can it make? Well, here's a spatial constant and the diffusion constant. And this is essentially the time scale for diffusion to, to clear out the molecules and to, to allow new ones come in and to make a new measurement. So these have to be statistically independent. So what's the new um, uh, measurement uncertainty? Well, uh, according to the central limit theorems, it's a standard deviation divided by the numbers of measurements, square root of them, in fact. And this then reflects the temporal averaging. So now the relative uncertainty for that kind of measurement is um, the same one as before, but now we divide by the square root of the numbers of measurements. And now we get this famous formula, which not only describes the spatial averaging, depending on the size of the measurement device cell, but also temporal averaging by delta t and also 
um, by the diffusion constant. So the faster diffusion, the more sampling, independent samples this I can do. This is just a heuristic derivation but um, it can also be um, calculated exactly as done by Burke and Purcell and then only the only difference is that the prefactors change. So what is it good for? So we can learn already now uh, that equalized cells make temporal measurements of the chemical gradient. So they compare in time if things get uh, higher the concentration or if they get smaller while they swim. And this is very different from spatial gradient sensing where the cell can compare measurements, let's say it's the cell front versus the back this is what traditionally being thought of what eukaryotic cells do because they are very large. So now what we have to realize is the measurement time is constrained. First of all, it's constrained by the runtime because it's a time when, um, uh, when the cell is swimming in a defined direction before it randomizes its orientation. And this is again limited by the rotational diffusion time. As I said, temperature is very important and at some point the cell loses its orientation by rotational diffusion. So the measurement has to be on this time scale. So now for this measurement to be meaningful, the difference between the measurements delta C needs to be significantly larger than the standard deviation and the difference shown here. And for temporal gradient sensing, and we have this expression. We can express this now in terms of the spatial gradient and introducing the velocity of the cell as the speed of the cell. And then we find that the measurement time, which is in two delta T because it's two measurements, for realistic gradients, what the cell is doing, and for run velocities, which are realistic, it's roughly one second. So that's consistent with what I found, what we discussed up here. For direct spatial sensing, it compares the front and the back. And now what the difference is that it introduces a small size of the cell, A. And because the cell is very small, uh, the measurement time is now very large. It's larger than one second for realistic parameters. And so we know now for the small cells, this can't really work. If you want to understand more about the signal processing in, at a time at a time when we didn't know much about the biochemistry, we can treat it as a black box. So we stimulate the cell and see what the output is doing. So it was also done by Howard Burke. Um, he developed not only the tracking microscope, but also the tested cell assay, where cells are attached with a single flagellum. And then so you see them spin clockwise or counterclockwise. So counterclockwise means that if all the flagella would do it, the cell would run. Clockwise would mean that, um, that the cell would tumble. And so it happens if at least one of them goes clockwise. So now we can study a single motor by just looking at the cell rotating. This can also be done with beats. So this signal is gonna be you know, binary and very noisy. And these durations are ex roughly exponentially distributed of these intervals. But now if we would average over many cells, then we get a smooth signal and we can analyze it. So we see immediately a lot of interesting things if you look at the counterclockwise the run bias, average over many cells. So if there's a very short pulse, a very short pulse, then we see a lot of different quantitative things. So first of all, we see that the response, the initial response is very large. So if you know a little bit of the ligand receptor binding, we see that this is roughly a gain of 50. So the ligand binding to the receptors is a, a small amount and then the response at the motor is huge. We also see the response lasts several seconds. So there's a slow component in the pathway, a, mem a sort of memory. We also see that the positive lobe compared to the baseline and the negative lobe when you integrate over them would integrate to zero. And this is a signature of precise adaptation and I will come back to this later. So we have this biphasic response so it also means that the near distant measurement has a different weight than the distant measurement, which has a negative weight. And so the cell, what it can do is it actually can calculate time derivatives. So now if it wants to measure the spatial gradient, it can actually get it by measuring the temporary gradient, as I mentioned already before. So we can even go further now and we can Fourier transform these signals. We can ask if frequency contributions to these temporal signals. So if we Fourier transform um, a sharp pulse, like a delta function, we would get a constant. This is a log-log plot, a Bode plot. And if we Fourier transform the motor signal, then we get this band pass filter. So we get certain frequencies which are passed through the motor and certain other frequencies, low and high, which are filtered out. So low frequencies are filtered out because of precise adaptation. So if they vary too slowly in time, they are removed 
And the cell can't respond to very, very fast signals because of the finite reaction times in the pathway. So these are the things we talked so far. We talked about diffusion, limiting accuracy. We talked about signal amplification or gain, precise adaptation. So the cell is doing temporary gradient sensing. We talked about the motor being a bandpass filter and so on. So the question is, how does it now work at a more mechanistic molecular level? And what are the design principles of the chemotaxis pathway? So you have to introduce a little bit more of what's the pathway. So there are different types of receptors which can sense different amino acids and sugars, also pH and temperature. And now we have this little pathway which transduces the signal from the receptors to the motor. So if the cell is swimming down a chemical gradient in the wrong direction, so there's less binding now to the receptors, and now we have a high activity of this molecule associated with the receptors, meaning it phosphorylates this other molecule which it diffuses around. So this KY molecule, it binds to the motor and induces tumbling. So the cell wants to reorient orient and find a new direction. So if the cell would now swim up the gradient, and so it swims in a good direction, then there would be more binding and this suppresses the activity of this molecule, this kinase. And we would get very little of this phosphorylated molecule because there's this phosphatase which removes it and we have no binding. So the default state of the motor is then running. So it wants to swim in this direction because it liked it. So sensory systems would saturate very quickly. Um, it wouldn't work over a wide range of chemical concentrations. So we have these adaptation enzymes, KR and KB, which now covalently modifies these four sites at the receptor and that can um, reset the sensitivity of the receptors. It counterbalances ligand binding, in fact. So now, in, during the recent years, um, experimentalists developed these so-called FRET probes, um, which measures the concentration of these so-called FRET pairs, um, KYP and KZ. And this is a readout of the activity of the receptor and this kinase activity. The FRET probe was developed by Victor Surchik, a former postdoc of Howard Burke and now MPI director in Marburg. And he's a collaborator of mine. And so genetically, you can modify these, these molecules by attaching fluorescent proteins to them. And now from the, you can excite them by a laser, they emit. But if they're close together because of high activity, you get an energy transfer on this frequency. And so from the ratio of these two intensities, you can get the concentration of FRET pairs and the activity. Now, we can look more quantitatively at these properties of the receptor signaling. So we can look at precise adaptation as a function of time. So when we have a step change, increase and decrease, we see a transient inhibition of the activity, so the cell would run, but it adapts more or less precisely, despite the concentration being still high. And when we remove it, we have the opposite response. So here's the cell would tumble. The experimentalists also can uh, genetically modify cells so they only express a single receptor type, and they can also be in different adaptation states, mimicking the methylation level of the receptors. And so we see that some receptors, when they're demesylated, um, are very inactive and they turn off very early when you add a little bit. And as they're mesylated, the highly adapted receptors are very insensitive, they're very active and they turn off in a very sort of sigmoidal way. This is what we call two regimes. And again, ligand binding turns the activity off. Yeah, so this is sort of the general feature and mesylation counterbalances it. So now if you have cells which actually have all the receptors, we realize from Fred here that the dynamic range increases to orders of magnitude and we have this amazing uh, dynamic range. So this was then explained a couple of decades ago by Tom Duke when he was working with Dennis Bray. And they thought that these receptor clusters might act like antennas. So one receptor is binding, but the neighboring receptors see the effect as well and amplify that way. So the sort of physical systems, so in magnetic systems, you have these um, uh, microscopic spins that can align and they can form a microscopic magnetization of the material. So the sort of this as well, in, along similar lines, they develop this two-dimensional icing lattice of receptors and they couple ferromagnetically, shown here. So they like to be in the same state. They couple with the nearest neighbors. And it also shows that ligand-bound receptors like to be inactive. And then there can be some average activity being defined and a correlation length defines roughly how many receptors are interacting with one another. So this is a signal amplification. There's a simpler model which is borrowed from Mono Weimeng Shang Shu model which was originally developed to describe cooperative oxygen binding to hemoglobin for transport in the blood. 
And um, and now in this case, we think of the larger receptor cluster as decomposed into smaller signaling complexes, and they are very strongly coupled. So each signaling complex can be only active or inactive. There's now only one activity variable. So that can ex explain the, the data similarly to this more complicated numerical solution of the Ising model. So, so the coupling is really strong in the so-called MWC model, um, much larger than the temperature. And now the activity is just the probability for this two-state system to be active. So it only depends on the free energy difference between the two activity states. So if you have a single type of receptor, we have N of these, and delta F is the free energy difference for one receptor. And it has contributions from methylation and ligand binding in these two states. Here's again the picture of it. So the MWC model, so can it explain the data? Yes, if you have a single receptor for different methylation states, it doesn't do very much. However, if you have 10 of these, we see that these two regimes are building. I mentioned earlier, and it compares favorably with the FRED data. If you have also receptors included, then we see these plateaus developing similar to the experiments, and this model can very well describe these remarkable signaling properties. So chemotax is really a sensory system, and there are interesting phenomenological laws like the Weber's law, and we can ask if that also applies in chemotaxis. So Weber's law says it's the smallest detectable stimulus one can notice um, is proportional to the background stimulus. So what he did in the 19th century, had people hold weights, it works also for other sensory systems, and he asked when he increased or decreased it, do, when do people notice a difference? And if the weight is small, you notice very small differences. If the weight is large, you need large differences to notice. This can be done using flow chambers, um, basically microfluidics with chemotaxis, again in the surgic lab. So you have a background and you can increase and decrease by step changes. So if a certain background C0 concentration, you can have larger and larger of these step changes. And from the initial amplitudes uh, going down and up, you can get these two curves for, let's say, for one background concentration. And if you increase now the background concentration, you have the same type of step changes you realize that you need much larger step changes to get similar type of responses, similar types of curves. So now Weber's law is about the smallest detectable stimulus. So we can introduce a small threshold and we say, you know, once the threshold is reached by the response, it's noticeable, it has to be outside the noise. And so the smallest detectable stimulus are now these horizontal stimuli, which are reaching the threshold. So we see now plotting delta C over C naught, even on a log log scale, we see over orders of magnitude, it's roughly linear. At some point it breaks down. In how this works, we can even find from our MWC model. So the threshold is a constant. Now we can expand it, we can uh, linearize it, and it's proportional to the stimulus delta C in this linear order. And we can expand this now in, in terms of partial derivatives. We can introduce a C0 here to get the relative um, uh, stimulus. And then we see is that these prefactors are actually constant over many conditions. So this is more or less constant because of precise adaptation. This is more or less constant because it's C0, because um, the binding strength is different, very different in these two states of the receptor. And so again, delta C is proportional to C0. There's also an integrated version of that thing, which indicates since there's a log dependence on this uh, ligand concentration, and this is exactly our, our free energy from the, from the receptor cluster. It's called the weber fechner law. And this work was done by Diana Klausnitzer, my first PhD student. So I didn't talk much about precise adaptation. However, we can also do this now. So I showed these curves before from Fred. So if you don't have the enzyme, it doesn't work the adaptation. And these enzymes, they mesylate receptors um, at these sites or demesylate them by KB. So mentioned already, ligand binding turns the activity off of the receptors. This was a dose response curve, which turned off. And now mesylation counterbalances it, so mesylation increases it again. If we want to model adaptation, we want we are interested in sort of a mean field description of the average mesylation level as a function of time because it's a slow dynamics, and we want to describe it with some rate law. How is activity um, changes with ligand uh, concentration? Well, we assume this binding and unbinding of ligand is fast for a given mesylation state. And that this equilibrates very quickly to this probability of being active from the from the previous slide. This is a basically a fast process, and we can do separation of time scales. 
So now it turns out that the rate law is very simple, that it only depends on the confirmation and state of the receptor. So inactive receptors are mesylated, independent of the details of ligand concentration and um, subset concentration, how many mesyl sites and so on. And the rate of, of demesylation is, depends on the activity. And under these conditions, it's easy to see, steady state, this guy is zero, and the adapted activity A0 is always a constant, always the same constant for each cell. It might vary from cell to cell because the enzyme concentrations change, but otherwise it's a constant. In different words, this is a stable fixed point because we can plot the null line, the rates, they're just linear here, and where they intersect, that's a steady state. And it's stable because let's say we add something, a ligand, and that decreases the activity, but now the mesylation rate increases over the demesylation rate, and so it increases by mesylation the activity, and we reach the stable fixed point. There's another way to think about it, which is in terms of control engineering. So if you wanted to track a certain temperature, like in an oven or in an air conditioning unit, we could say, if there's an error in the temperature, we could say we change the heat, we add heat if the temperature is still a little bit too low, but this would lead to instabilities. It can lead to oscillations because there might be sensory errors in our, in our sensor in the oven. A much better way is to indicate over the error and to see if there is a net error after a certain amount of time and then only to increase the heat. This is similar in the chemotaxis system. So here we can, um, we can introduce all the error compared to the steady state activity and also um, a variation of the mesolation level compared to the adapted one. And our model was anyway linear, so that's very simple. And now we see the net change in mesolation is just the integral in time over the activity. And we have again the integral feedback control. So now I wanted to come to information theory. So that chemotaxis is really the result of information flow in the pathway. So from simulations again, this was done by Gabriele Michali, another PhD student. Um, you see these trajectories of cells swimming up a, an exponential increase in gradient. So the trajectory aligns very well with the chemical gradient and here as well, but here not at all and here as well not. So we can also express this in terms of the drift velocity, which is the average cell velocity in the direction of the gradient. And this velocity has indeed these two peaks as illustrated up here. And that can be confirmed by also by um, analytical theory and also by experiments here, again, from the Sergic lab. And so what happens now here is not a mystery. These are the, reg the regimes of ligand concentration where the two main receptors are sensitive to this ligand. So without information flow, without sensing, um, there's no chemotaxis. It's not just a physical property of the, of the cells. Um, it's about um, signal processing. And so the question is how we can formalize this information flow. So this is sort of illustrated here. So before I talked about these flow chamber experiments with very well-defined stimuli, but in reality, thinking back to the visual system, we have this broad range of natural stimuli the cell is exposed to. Here, input concentrations. And now they might be very different in an infinite number of possible input-output curves. Um, and then these are inputs are then transduced into outputs and they affect the swimming behavior. And there are many other cells and there are many sources and things of nutrients. And this complex uh, mass is essentially producing these input concentrations. So now we would imagine that by evolution, certain input-output relationships are selected so to this information to flow. Otherwise, the cell doesn't notice it. And um, yeah, and if we assume that information flow is maximized in this pathway, then we expect matching relationships between input distributions and input output curves and input output curves and output distributions. So now if we know a lot about the signaling pathway, let's say from FRED experiments, we ought to be also able to learn something or infer something about these input distributions, sort of by reverse engineering. And maybe even from here, we can learn something about the chemical gradients the cells are experiencing. These are often inaccessible from experiments. So now we have to introduce a little bit of information theory. And information theory was essentially developed by Claude Shannon in the 1940s, and it hasn't significantly changed. So the idea is now that you try to uh, send messages through a communication channel, they're encoded, they can be corrupted by noise and they're decoded. And then the question is, how, what, what can you learn about the inputs from whatever you get at the output? So you can think of it as messages being drawn from a distribution like letters of an English alphabet. And then the uh, person on the other side tries to infer what the message was. So how do we find information? 
So if there's something very uncertain, like a probability of a message, P of X is very small, then we would expect we're very surprised and we learn a lot. So we would also expect um, for an uncertain message to gain a lot of information. So in, effectively information is the uncertainty. So it can be defined as minus log base two of P of X and the units are in bits. And um, it has certain interesting properties. We can also average over the probability distribution of these messages and we get the famous Shannon entropy formula. So now coming back to the information and submissions to the channel. So we are not really uh, want to use the Shannon entropy specifically, but we want to use the mutual information, a related quantity. So this is I of X and Y. So it measures the correlation between X and Y. It's symmetric. And we see it's bound by uh, from below by zero because if the joint distribution factorizes because the inputs and outputs X and Y are in independent, then we get log one, which is zero. But maximally, it's also limited by the Shannon entropies of the individual distributions because we can't learn more than what's in these distributions. It's also very attractive because it might be considered a universal language in biology. So now what can we do with information theory? There has been some really nice work from by Simon Laughlin in the 80s on the compound eye of the fly. So basic neuroscience effectively. So below the photoreceptors, there's these large monopolar cells, which are actually have graded responses. They don't have action potentials. And by applying maximal information transmission, what he found is that these, indeed that these input distributions and input output and output distributions are actually matched. Um, in fact, the input output curve is a cumulative distribution of the input distribution. And uh, by assumption, the output distribution is a flat distribution. So all output levels are used with equal probability. So it automatically also means that uh, where it matters, you have a higher resolution than where it doesn't matter. And clearly there must be matching relationships because if you take this curve and you move it to the left or to the right, you would only get saturated responses wherever you have stimuli. Or if it's too shallow, you don't use all your output levels. Or if it's too steep, you also saturate. So they certainly have to be matching relationships for good information flow. However, this is neglected noise. So we, as I mentioned in the beginning, noise really matters. And there are different types of noise. So there's this extrinsic noise um, or input noise, which comes from, let's say, these ligands binding its receptors by diffusion. And that could be potentially be described as this Birkin Purcell noise where maybe this volume now corresponds to some sort of ligand binding pocket and the cell is now trying to count molecules. And there's also intrinsic noise because um, the receptors switching their states or phosphorylation levels are, are also stochastic processes and so on. So if you apply simple noise propagation, there's a total output noise, which is the intrinsic noise inside the cell plus the extrinsic input noise, which is amplified by the gain, by the derivative of the dose response curve input output curve and how does it affect things so well we can first of all make some analytic progress if we start with the mutual information and now we have to um, transfer these um, uh, input output curves to distributions information theory is about distributions and if we make the assumptions that the conditional entropy the conditional probability distribution is a gaussian if the noise is rather small so the output levels are scattered around the mean value very narrowly, then we can make analytic progress. So we can write this in a simplified way, way of mutual information. Now we're trying to find these functions. So input distribution, gain, noise, which maximizes mutual information. So this is essentially calculus of variation. We can call this a Lagrangian and we can derive the Euler Lagrange equations. So this first one comes from maximizing with respect to the input distribution. The second one comes from maximizing with respect to the input output curves. So yeah, I just want to show a very simple example where we maximize with respect to the input output curve. And given a certain amount of noise, we can derive these matching relationships very easily. So the input distribution is proportional to the gain, total noise, and inversely to the intrinsic noise. And so what is the effect of it? We could think of these noises as being error bars. So extrinsic noise might be the horizontal error bar, which describes how uncertain the, the ligand concentration is measured. Then there are these um, intrinsic noise sources, which are the vertical error bars and the total one. So we can look at limiting cases of so intrinsic noise is very large, much larger than the extrinsic noise. We find that the gain is proportional to the intrinsic noise. So we basically, if this is very large, we want very steep curves to resolve the vertical error bars. If the intrinsic noise is very small compared to the extrinsic, so these are very large, we want a very shallow curve, a small gain to resolve these errors in the input.
However, because input distributions are normally peaked, we get a sigmoidal type of curve and we don't trust these values because they have the largest errors. So the output distribution might become bimodal where we only trust in the extreme case very low and very high levels and not intermediate levels. Of course, now we can do stuff with our bacteria chemotax system. For a single receptor type, we have four adaptation states and these input output curves. And if you have some information about the noise as well, we can predict the input distributions and the output distributions. So the input distributions are log normal, that's a log scale. And if we normalize by the mean value, they collapse. This is again Weber's law. So the distribution is a broad as a larger the background concentration is. And ultimately also the logarithmic version, the fever fechner law. And this reflects the logarithmic dependence of the free energy on the ligand concentration. So what can we learn about the chemical gradients? So we can go do simulations where we try out different gradient steepnesses, different linear gradients, and we can look at these cells, how they swim up the chemical gradient. And then we can uh, try to catch the cells when they have the correct adaptation state uh, and can compare what say cell notices in terms of ligand concentration with the prediction of information theory, the black curve, which is always the same here. And we realize when the immediate gradients assume the best up the chemical gradient, so we have the highest drift here. For very shallow gradients, they don't swim very well. The distributions of inputs are very symmetric because they're always adapted. If they're too steep, it's a very nice asymmetric input distribution, which is good. But then they saturate very quickly and then they run out of steam. So in the immediate gradients, we have maximum information transmission and we have the largest drift. So best behavior of the chemical gradient. So we can now use these four different um, adaptation states here from experiments. And here again, when we match the information theory, we get the highest drift. However, also the relative gradients are roughly the same. So relative gradient is gradient, linear gradient over background. It's this mesolation state, adaptation state. And that means when the relative gradient is the same, we have an exponential gradient because that's when the relative gradient is always the same. And if we stitch it together, we see also that matches the exponential gradient. So it fits very nicely, say, logarithmic sensing from Weber's law because exponential gradients are not saturating the free energy because there's this logarithmic dependence. So they can sense very well exponential gradients. That might mean that the cells care about exponential gradients um, in particular because they're very important or because um, they're very abundant in nature. I don't know. There are also a number of interesting open questions, despite bacteria chemotax being very well investigated over decades. So in the mono weiming chang model, we didn't worry about these um, strong interactions. So everything was strongly coupled in a cluster. However, in the Ising model, we have the nearest neighbor coupling, which is physically motivated and makes sense. So in the Ising model, we have the signal amplification, like in the MWC model. But in the Ising model, we also amplify the noise. So cooperativity also amplifies the noise. So the signal to noise ratio, which is also important for information transmission, declines in fact with increasing coupling strengths. This was work done by my former supervisor, Ned Wintgreen, who by the way was involved in a lot of these um, activities. Um, so that's one outstanding problem. So which speaks against the importance of information flow or maximizing it. Another important problem is Besides the dose response curves of the receptors, there's also input output curves or dose response curves measured for the motor bias. And in fact, these are very, very steep. So the Hill coefficient describing the cooperativity sigmoidal shape is the largest ever measured, which is 20. So if you have a step change effectively, all you can transmit is a bit. So it doesn't really matter how much information you transmit at the receptors, if it's cut down to one bit at the motors. So in recent work, we try to address this problem and we, I think we solved it by using the fact that E. coli has many um, motors, so six to eight. And if you have this fan-like structure, multiple outputs, you can then, um, and they are sufficiently or conditionally independent, then you can um, get higher information transmission at the motors as well, because there are m several motors. However, there are you know, a bunch of problems um, still to be solved. So in summary, I talked about two different models, Ising and MWC models, which can both explain gain and precise adaptation. But the Ising model has the issues that the signal to noise ratio declines with coupling strengths. Um, and then I talked about bacteria chemotax being really a sensory system, which also follows Weber's law. And if we maximize information transmission, we get particular matching relationships. From here, we can reverse engineer the distribution of inputs and we can find that 
cells uh, work very well with exponential gradients, in fact. Um, maybe it's the most important thing is then when we maximize information flow, the drift velocity up the chemical gradient and hence behavior is maximized. So that works very nicely together. What I haven't really talked about is the time dependence in this pathway. And you know, adaptation is of course um, changing over a slow time scale. So in fact, the ideal scenario would be that all these things are done in time based on trajectories. So I would have to deal with path integrals in this case. And this is something which might be investigated in the future. Okay, so I wanted to acknowledge the people who did most of the work, in particular the two talented PhD students, Diana Klausnitzer and Gabriele Michali. And um, the data came from Victor Sergic's lab in Marburg. And I thank my funding sources and thanks for listening. I hope you liked the talk. Um, as I said, I gave this talk four times at different universities as part of this Tom Duke Lecture Award.